Happy 10th anniversary, Kingdom Hearts! Well, this is technically on September 17th, but still, I just had to make a Kingdom Hearts related countdown. I mean, look at these games. It mixes Japanese RPG like Final Fantasy with the charm of classic Disney movies and includes an addictive and fun combat system. Now, I haven't played all Kingdom Hearts games, so I knew I couldn't make a top 10 Kingdom Hearts bosses, but then I realized it. What's the franchise's biggest selling point? The Disney World. Reviving the greatest moments of your childhood in a fun game was awesome, and now I'll tell you my 10 favorite Disney Worlds. Remember I haven't played Birth by Sleep or Dream Drop Distance, so I'll include worlds of only the main two Kingdom Hearts games. I will judge these levels by design, story, navigation, music, bosses, and most importantly, how well they represent the movie from where they came from. Oh, and if a world appears in both games, my opinion will be based on both interpretations. So, let's cut the talking and start this huge Kingdom Hearts tribute! Honestly, I never really had a problem with Atlantica like everybody else did. Yeah, of course, it was a water level, and we all hate those, but the controls were the same ones used for flying, and they were not that bad. Seeing Sora as a merman and Donald and Goofy as, well, that was really funny, and I just enjoyed traveling through this underwater city with one of my favorite Disney characters, Ariel. On the subject of her, I think the movie was represented in a great way, with the problem of Ariel wanting to go outside of the water and Ursula using her for her own evil motives. The poses were really fun, nothing too impressive, but really entertaining, especially that creepy battle against giant Ursula, and the music was great. Listen to this, a great instrumental version of Under the Sea plays in the background. Excellent. Overall, Atlantica was fun, unique and interesting, but it's only number 10 because I am talking about the version in the first Kingdom Hearts only. Let's act as if the second version never existed. Ah, no! Stop it! Next number, next number, next number! Land of Dragons was amazing. Mulan is truly an epic movie, and it shows a great message of how women can be as strong as men, and this is shown in an excellent way in Kingdom Hearts 2, since you will meet the protagonist of the movie disguised as a man so she can enter the Chinese army and fight against Shan Yu, who can use Heartless, just like most Disney villains in Kingdom Hearts. The world itself was huge and it had a lot of variety, from the Chinese town to the army camp and the snowy mountain, every environment is done in an excellent way. Although the boss against Dan Ju was decent, the battle against the Storm Rider was simply amazing! The Storm Rider was a Chinese ancient dragon god who was turned into a heartless by Sigbar. That's an excellent concept for a boss, and it fits perfectly for the universe of Mulan. Land of Dragons was beautiful, unique, and had some great boss fights. But why it's only number 9? Well, because the next 8 wars are just better. Kingdom Hearts series are a big Disney tribute, so what's the best way to make a Disney homage? Making a world based on the first movie Walt Disney ever made. Fucking genius! 
Timeless River is based off Steamboat Willie, and we all know what that is. This world is in black and white and features some old Disney characters from old black and white Disney cartoons. So this world already wins a lot of points for having a lot of nostalgic value. The design chain of Sora, Donald and Goofy was hilarious. Look at them, they look funny. Since the old Disney cartoons didn't have much story, it was modified to fit the game. In this world you will meet a past version of Mickey Mouse, who is trying to protect the world from the heartless sent by the present version of Pete, who is trying to steal the powerful cornerstone of light from the past. And this is why Timeless River is only at number 8. You will have to enter different areas and kill heartless, nothing more. While these areas are unique and reminiscent of the first day of Disney, this can get repetitive. However, Timeless River redeems itself with the complete and fun boss battle against Pete. Overall, Timeless River is an excellent Walt Disney tribute, and the unique art style and nostalgic value puts it at number 8 on my list. I am sure nobody, nobody expected to have a world based on Pirates of the Caribbean. I mean, that movie is so dark and mature and it suddenly appeared in a colorful game like Kingdom Hearts. Sadly, it's exactly this why Port Royal is not higher on the list, since the fact that this game is not M rated, some content of the movie had to be taken off. But don't get me wrong, I still think the story of this world was great, since you will have to help Jack Sparrow and Will Turner retrieve the treasure that turns the crew of the Black Pearl into zombies when they are exposed to moonlight. You can only harm them right there, while this is original, the pirates can become very annoying with time. This world was great and the atmosphere was excellent. Also, look at the graphics, these realistic human models look awesome for its time. Too bad they couldn't get the actors of the movie to reprise their roles here. The boss fight against Barbosa was... meh. But the battle against the Green Reaper Heartless was original and really fun since you could only harm it when the gold was on the treasure. This war was excellent and unexpected, and I would love to see it returning in Kingdom Hearts 3 since the Pirates of the Caribbean universe has expanded a lot since 2005. I'm going to be honest with you, I've never watched Tron. WHY NOT?! It's because I never had the chance, but I did research for this countdown and it turned out that Space Paranoid is very loyal to the original movie. Of course, the plot had to be changed so that Ansem was the one who created this world, instead of Kevin Flynn. The world itself was very entertaining, with music, art style and enemies that managed to make a great virtual atmosphere. Also, it was more creative since it had more puzzles and even let you drive that amazing light motorcycle from the movie. And this war wins points because of him, since he's such an interesting character, especially at the end when he starts developing feelings despite being a computer program. He will help you fight the MCP in a very creative and interesting boss battle. In conclusion, Space Paranoid was atmospheric, artistic and very entertaining. I know a world based on the sequel, Tron Legacy, appears in Drip Drop Distance, and I would love to play that, but still, I wish to include this guy in the next Kingdom Hearts. I came up with a concept for this, for this Tron guy costume by going to a science fiction convention that also was a crossover to a computer convention. Honestly, I was very skeptical when I found out there was a world based on the Beauty and the Beast, but with time, Beast Castle started growing on me until the point I absolutely fell in love with it. This world has, hands down, the best story of all Disney levels in Kingdom Hearts. 
a member of Organization 13, Soldin, steals the rose that holds Prince Adam's curse so he could get so angry that darkness would invade his heart and then he could transform into a heartless and a nobody. This plot gets so intense in the second visit that you even have to fight the beast. Of course, this work has its flaws, especially since they forgot some elements of the movie, like Gaston. Motherfucking Gaston! The bosses of Beast Castles were great. The Dark Thorn Heartless was unique and really entertaining, while Saldin, although it was hard and frustrating, also gave an excellent battle. Beast Castles was full of emotion and it had some great bosses, but it would have been higher if they included more things from the movie and if it wasn't just a castle. I mean, they could have made a whole town, not only one castle. And that's a shame, because this little castle is amazing. The Nightmare Before Christmas was an excellent movie that mixed the concept of both Halloween and Christmas, and when I saw there was a world based on this movie in both Kingdom Hearts games, I almost shit myself. In the first game, Halloween Town was great, it had a good atmosphere, Oogie Boogie was an excellent villain and the world itself was just very funny to play in, but there was something missing. Oh yeah, Christmas! There was nothing related to Christmas in the first version of Halloween Town. Luckily, this was corrected in Kingdom Hearts 2, in which Santa Claus and Christmas towns were the main parts of the story, redeeming this world. As I said before, Oogie Boogie was an excellent villain, especially with the creative boss battle he was part of. I know I said this tons of times in this countdown, but seriously, these fights are so fun and unexpected, and I can't live without saying how awesome the background music is. Similar to Atlantica, here we have an instrumental version of This Is Halloween, one of the best movie songs ever. Overall, Halloween Town was an excellent interpretation of The Nightmare Before Christmas, with a great design, likable characters and fan bosses. A truly epic world based on a truly epic movie. My favorite classic Disney movie has to be Aladdin. This movie was perfect, with some of the most interesting characters and settings, and both Kingdom Hearts games knew this perfectly by creating an amazing world based on Aladdin. Agrabah was the world that, for me, represented this movie in the best way. The setting looked perfect, with both the town and the Cape of Wonders being places you could play in. Jafar had always been a likable villain and this game is no exception, but my favorite character must be the genie who always knows what to say in a hilarious way. Even if they couldn't get Robin Williams for this role, this dude will always be hilarious, and thank god he can become a sumo later. And Aladdin even frees him at the end with his last wish, just like the movie. Agrabah also wins points because you could also fly on Aladdin's magic carpet, and this made up for some fun gameplay variety, especially in the amazing boss battle against Genie Jafar in the second game. In the subject of bosses, you could also fight the head of the Cave of Wonders, that's an excellent interpretation of this amazing movie in a great boss battle. Agra was excellent, it knew how to match its original movie and was just very fun and enjoyable. Too bad that this world was a pain in the ass in the first game, both the town and the Cave of Wonders were confusing and you didn't know where to go, yet this was corrected in the second game, where Agra was bigger and easier to navigate making me love this world even more. In the first Kingdom Hearts, the Olympus Coliseum was different from the other levels. In this world, the only thing you did was fighting tons of enemies in a fan tournament. This was both good, because it was more original and creative, but it was also bad, because it looked lazy and left you wanting more. Thank god the universe of Hercules was expanded in Kingdom Hearts 2, 
where you could visit the underworld and experience the great story of this Greek mythology movie, especially with the amazing villain that is Hades. He's so fun and so evil, he was represented just as he was in the film, just an amazing villain. Let's not forget the Olympus Coliseum is still the only Disney World that features Final Fantasy characters. In the first game, you meet Cloud Strife. I mean, I'm not a big fan of him, but he's one of the most recognizable video game icons ever, and seeing him along with a heroic movie figure like Hercules felt amazing. In the second game, we meet Auron from Final Fantasy X. While I've never played that game, I find him as a very interesting character and one of the most badass ones. Finally, I must say this world had some of the best boss fights ever. Some of the best examples are the Cerberus and oh god the Hydra! Kratos looks like a pussy compared to Sora when you fight these big ass monsters. Well, actually not, but still, these battles were huge and tons of fun. But definitely the best reason I love Olympus Coliseum must be that it's the only world with replay value. If you finish the game, you could always return to the Colosseum and fight in different and fun tournaments. Because of all these reasons, Olympus Colosseum was my second favorite Disney World. But the question remains, what could be it? Well, let's recap! Number 10, Atlantica. Number 9, The Land of Dragons. Number 8, Timeless River. Number 7, Port Royal. Number 6, Space Paranoid. Number 5, Beast Castle. Number 4, Halloween Town. Number 3, Agraba, and number 2, Olympus Colosseum. You may not agree with me here, but since I am a kid from the 90s and grew up with the Lion King, I absolutely fell in love with the Pride Lands. We all know nostalgia may be overrated at times, and even though I am aware of that, I just came up with the conclusion that this world is absolutely epic. First of all, as a level, Pride Lands is just amazing. It's really huge and has tons of variety. The navigation was a stellar feature, since you could use the new ability Drift to make Sora run very fast. And trust me, this is tons of fun. Oh, I almost forgot, Sora transforms into a lion in this world, while Donald becomes a bird and Goofy a turtle. I don't know how the hell does that works, but I think it's freaking amazing. The movie was represented in an excellent way, with Simba not being able to return to his home and claim his place as a king because he thinks he's responsible for his father's death, while the real murderer was his evil uncle's car. Sora, Donald and Goofy must help Nala convince Simba and make him the new king of the Pride Lands. This story is great and can be emotional at times. Also, after you beat Scar, the game adds its own part to the plot by making the ghost of Scar Heartless wander around the place trying to make Simba furious. That's great. I don't know how a Lion Heartless can have a ghost, but it's rather original. Of course, this world has some flaws. For example, this big African savanna can feel empty. I mean, where are the animals? Oh, they are turning into heartless. So I am able to forgive that. What I'll never forgive is the fact that the fight against Harless Scar had zero atmosphere. I mean, look at the battle in the movie, with the fire and the storm in the background. If all that was in the game, this boss fight would have been a lot better. However, I think the Pride Lands redeemed itself with the epic fight against the Ground Shaker. This heartless felt like a boss from Shadow of the Colossus. That's plain epic. The Pride Lands are my favorite Disney World because they revived the memories of one of my favorite movies ever in an excellent way, with great design and an emotional plot. This world may not be as complete as other ones, but it was the one I had the most fun with, and that is enough to be my favorite Disney World in Kingdom Hearts. If you still disagree with me, it doesn't matter. Kingdom Hearts is full of great moments, characters, worlds, and more. We must join together and celebrate the 10th anniversary of this amazing series while we wait for the third installment. I'm Obsidious Fan and long live Kingdom Hearts!